I think this is a good bridge to AI, where which is where you and I met at uh, the conference that you organized through your institute. One question I have for you is, you know, I came away from that conference, really, I came into that conference really as a as an utter novice on this topic. I had just more or less ignored AI, uh, having accepted the rumors that there more or less no progress had been made, all the promises had been overblown, and uh, there was not much to worry about. And it was kind of a, just a dead end scientifically. And then I heard, you know, our mutual friend Elon Musk and other people like Stephen Hawking uh, worrying out loud about the prospect of of AI, and very much in the in the near term, you know, whether you're, whether it's five years or fifty years, we're talking about in a time frame that that any rational person, uh, certainly any rational person who has kids, could worry about, could make you know huge gains, which could well destroy us if we don't anticipate the ways in which machines more intelligent than ourselves could fail to converge with our interests and, and could fail to be controllable, ultimately controllable by us. I've mentioned this on the podcast a few times, and, and I've recommended Nick Bostrom's book on this topic, uh, Superintelligence, which uh, is really a great summary of, of the problem. So I, my question for you is, you and I both answered the, the, the edge question my response to which is, is also on my blog. The Edge question was on this topic right after the conference in San Juan that you organized. And I noticed that there, there are many smart people, many of whom should be very close to this the data here, who are really deeply skeptical that there's anything to worry about here. I mean, so friends and colleagues of, of mine and, and perhaps yours, like Steven Pinker and Lawrence Krauss, take a very different line here. And more or less have said that concerns about AI are totally overblown and that there's no reason to think that that there should be safety concerns that will just kind of get into the end zone. And it, I mean, they're basically treating it like the Y2K scare. And I'm, I'm just wondering what what you think about that and, and what accounts for that. So this is this is fascinating. I've noticed this too. This is a question more than any other where I, I think a lot where, first of all, there's there so unfamiliar questions that a lot of very smart people actually get confused about them. And also, there are, it's also interesting to be clear on the fact that people who say don't worry very often disagree with one another. Hmm. So you have, for example, one camp who say, let's not worry because we're never going to get machines smarter than people, You have, or at least not for hundreds of years. And this camp includes a lot of um, famous business people and a lot of great people in the AI field also. You had Andrew, Andrew Ng, for example, saying recently that Worrying about AI becoming smarter than people and causing problems is like worrying about overpopulation on Mars, right? He's a good ambassador mm. for that camp. Mm. And you have to respect that. It might very well be that we will not get anything like human-level AI for hundreds of years. Then you have another group of very smart people who say, don't worry, for sort of the opposite reason. They, they say, let's not wor- We are convinced that we are going to get human-level AI probably in our lifetime with, with good odds, but it's going to be fine. I, I call these the digital utopians, mm. uh, and there's a fine tradition in this. Also, you have a beautiful lot of beautiful books by people like Hans Moravec, Ray Kurzweil, and um, also a lot of leading people in the AI field fall into that, that camp. They they think that AI is going to succeed. That's why they're working on it so hard right now, and they're convinced that it's not going to go wrong. So, <laughs> for starters, I would love to have a debate between these two groups of people. That, that we both don't worry about why they differ so much in their timelines. Um, my own attitude about this is, I agree, we certainly don't know for sure that we're going to get human-level AI, or that if we do, it's going to be a great problem. But we also don't know for sure that it's not going to happen. And um, as long as we are not sure that it's not going to be a disaster in our lifetime, it's it's good strategy to pay some attention to it now. Just like even if you're figuring your house is probably not going to burn down, it's still good to have a fire extinguisher and not leave the candles burning when you go to bed. You know, take some precautions. Right? That was very much the spirit of this conference. Look at concrete things we can do now to increase the chances of things going well. And finally, I think we have to stress that as opposed to other things you could worry about, like nuclear war or some new horrible virus or whatever, this question of AI is not just something negative it's also something which has Mm. a huge potential upside we have so many terrible problems in the world that we're failing to solve because we're we don't understand things well enough and if we can amplify our intelligence with artificial intelligence it will give us great power to do things better for the life in the future 
Uh, but, you know, as with any powerful technology that can be used for good, it can also be used, of course, to screw up. And when we've invented uh, less powerful tech in the past, like when we invented fire, we learned from our mistakes. And then we invented the fire extinguisher and, and things were more or less fine, right? But with more powerful tech like nuclear weapons, synthetic biology, future super advanced AI, <laughs> we don't want to learn from our mistakes. We really want to get it right the first time. Yeah. Because that might be the only yeah. thing we have. Well, that, yeah, and that's that's what, in my view and in the views of many people, that's what makes this AI issue unique because we're talking about ultimately autonomous systems that exceed us in intelligence. And as you say, that the, the temptation to turn these systems loose on the problems that the other problems that we confront is going to be exquisite. Of course, we want something that can help us cure Alzheimer's or cure Alzheimer's on its own and stabilize economies right. and do everything else that give us a perfect, you know, climate science, etc. Uh, so it's, I mean, there's nothing better than intelligence and to have more of it would seem an intrinsic good, except if you imagine failing to anticipate the way this, you, you could essentially get a, you know, what, I.J. Good described as an intelligence explosion where this thing could get away right. from us and we would we would not be able to say, oh, no, sorry, that's not what we meant here. Let's let's modify your code. Exactly. But many smart people just have a fundamental doubt that any sort of intelligence explosion is possible. That's that's the sense I'm getting. They, they view it very much like other things like fire or nuclear weapons where, you know, all technology is powerful and you don't want it to fall into the wrong hands and you don't, you know, people can use it maliciously or stupidly. And, but we understand that. And they think it, it doesn't really go beyond that. that. There's no reason. I mean, people trivialize this by saying that there's no reason to think that computers are, are, are going to become malicious. Like, the, and, and, you know, they're, where they're going to spawn armies of Terminator robots because they decide they want to right. kill human beings. But that's really not the fear. The fear is not that they will be spontaneously become malevolent. It's that we could fail to anticipate some way in which their behavior could diverge, however subtly, but, you know, f ultimately fatally from our own interests and to have this thing get away from us in a way that we can no longer correct for. That's That, to me, is the concern. Exactly. We should not fear malevolence. We should fear competence. Hmm. Because if you have an... Ex you know, what is intelligence to an AI researcher? It's simply the ability... It's simply being really good at accomplishing your goals, whatever they are. A chess computer is considered very intelligent if it's really good at winning in chess. And um, there is another game called Losing Chess, which has the opposite goal, where you try to lose. And there, a, a computer is considered good, intelligent if, it's, if it loses the game better than mm -hmm. any of the others. So the, the goals have, very, have nothing really to do with how competent it is. And that means that we have to be really careful if we build something more intelligent than us to also have its goals aligned with our goals. It's for a silly example, if you have a super intelligent, if you have a very intelligent self-driving car with speech recognition and you tell it, take me to the airport as fast as possible, you're going to get to the airport chased by helicopters and covered in vomit. And mm -hmm. you're going to be like, that's not what I wanted. And it'll be like, that's what you told me to do. Right. And you're like, well, that's not what I meant. Uh, and, but this illustrates how challenging it can be to get the goals right. And the, the, these, there are a lot of beautiful myths from antiquity going all the way back to King Midas mm -hmm. on exactly this theme. Right? He thought it would be a great idea if everything he touched turned to gold until he touched his dinner and then touched his daughter and got what he asked for. And competence, if you think about why we have done more damage to other species than any other species has on Earth, uh, it's not because we're evil, hmm. but it's because we're so competent, right? Like, do you hate, what about you, for example? Do you personally hate ants, would you say? No, no, that's, I mean, that's a gr great analogy. It's just that I, I, insofar as I, my disregard for them is fatal to many of them, and I'm so unaware of their interests that uh, my mere presence is a threat to them, and as it, right. you know, as is our civilization's presence to every other species. And what we're talking about here, if again, if you're, it's very hard to resist the slide into this not being just possible but inevitable. The moment you right. admit that intelligence and sentience ultimately is just a matter of what 
some appropriate computational system does, and you admit that we're going to we'll keep making progress building such systems indefinitely unless we destroy ourselves some other way, well, then at some point we're, we're going to realize in silicon or some other material systems that exceed us in, in every way and may ultimately uh, have a level of experience and, and, and insight and you know, f- form instrumental goals. That's right. Which are no more cognizant of our own than we are of those of ants. You know, if, if we learned exactly. that ants had invented us, that would still not put us in touch with their needs or concerns. That's right. And, and then for an example about that, we, you actually know that in a certain sense, your genes have invented you, right? Mm. They built your brain so that you could re- make copies of your genes. That's why you like to eat so you don't starve to death. And, and that's why we humans fall in love and do other things to make copies of our genes, right? But even though we know that, mm. we still choose to use birth control, which is exactly the opposite of what our genes want. And it, as you say, it'll be the same with the ants. And, and I think some people dismiss the idea that you can never have things smarter than humans simply for mystical reasons, because they think that there's something more than quarks and electrons and information processing going on in us. But if you take the scientific approach that you really are your quarks, right, then there's clearly no fundamental re- law of physics that says that we can never have anything more intelligent than a human. We know that we were constrained very much by how many quarks you could fit into a skull and, and, and stuff like that, right? Constraints that computers don't have. And um, it becomes instead more a question of time and as you said there's such relentless pressure to make smarter things because it's profitable and interesting and useful that i think the question isn't if it's going to happen but when and and finally just to come back to those ads again uh to just drive home the point that it's really competence rather than malevolence that uh, we should fear if those ants were thinking about whether to invent you or not right someone might say well i i know that sam Actually, he saw me on the street once and he went out of his way to not step on me. Mm. So that may mean I feel safe. I don't worry about creating Sam Harris. But that would be a mistake because sometimes you're jogging at night and you just don't see the ants. And the ants just aren't sufficiently imp- high up on your list of goals that, that, that for you to pay the extra attention and see if there are any ants there before you step where you put your feet down. right? And suppose now you're in charge of this uh, huge green energy project. And just as you're about to let the water flood this hydroelectric dam that you've, that you've built, someone points out that there's an ant hill right in the middle of it. Now mm-hmm. you actually know that the ants don't want to be drowned, right? And, and you have this decision. What are you going to do? Yeah, well, too bad for the ants in that case. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. And we, want, I think, want to plan things ahead so that we don't end up in the role of the ants.